Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man who is considered a superhero because he just saved a beer that was trapped in my refrigerator. <laughs> it's Dale. I have freedom. That's free, it. Free at last, free at last. That's it. Save the beer, man. That's right. How's it going today, bud? Doing well. Rainy day. Yep. Doing a little recording today. Yeah. You got any shout outs for us or any kind of housekeeping going on, dude? Yeah, yeah, we got a few shout outs to get through. A couple of Instagram folks I'd like to give a shout out to because they always want to comment and keeping up with what we're doing. Uh, Mackenzie at um, Mackenzie Kathleen on Instagram. Uh, Deborah at D Louise 90 on Instagram. And uh, Christopher Lee at Screwbiter on Instagram. All right. Shout out to those folks. We appreciate y'all going on there and liking our content and follow us and all that good stuff. Keeping up with what we're doing. Yeah, and everybody go on there and follow us. Give us a shout out. Give us a like. Go to our Facebook page. Go to our YouTube. Subscribe. Click the notification bell. Yeah, but definitely. We need some more of them. And go to our website and check out the store page. Get you a t-shirt. Get you a mug. Get you something cool. Throw some gas money. Yep. Whatever you want to do. That's right. We ain't, we ain't biggie. Mm-mm. All right, Dale. We're going to get into this week's episode. All right. And just to remind everybody, this episode could get a little rough. So if you got any small kids or, you know, something, some things bother you about... Adult talk. Adult talk. Yeah. This big grown folks. Yeah, grown folks. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're welcome to turn it off or get the kids out of the room while you listen to it. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, all right. All right, Dale, we're going to get into this week's episode. Let's do it. All right, man, this is the disappearance of Heather Elvis. Man, that is a cool name, man. Absolutely. Yeah, Heather's a cool name. Oh, you're talking about Elvis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But Elvis is her, <laughs> Elvis is her last name, but this is the disappearance of Heather Elvis. Heather Elvis was born on June 30th, 1993, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Myrtle Beach. Yep. And she, like I said, she was a native of Horry County, and she graduated in 2011 from St. James High School in Myrtle's Inlet. It's just like a little, you know, suburb of Myrtle Beach. Right. And uh, Heather's parents, you know, that she was the oldest daughter, and they allowed her to move into her own apartment after she graduated into a apartment complex called Carolina Forest. Yeah, right, straight out of high school, right? Yeah. I think they gave her some problems, too. I think she was... Wait, you think she gave them problems, or they gave her problems? It might have been a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, she just wasn't getting along too well with her parents. Right. Yeah, and she lived from place to place, and I, I even heard she was sleeping on different couches at night, and, and at one point, even homeless. Yeah. Until she... Moved into that apartment complex at Carolina Forest. And at that time, she had had a roommate. Her name was Brianna Warrelman. Right. She was working as a hostess at the Tilted Kilt. Yeah, because she was underage, so she couldn't. She serve was only alcohol. She was only 20 years old at the time, so she couldn't serve alcohol. That's right. right. And you've been to a Tilted Kilt before. I have. Can you tell us a little bit about what a Tilted Kilt restaurant is it's a really high end no it's kind of like a it's kind of like a hooters yeah in a way it's a like bar food kind of stuff but the waitresses wear like skimpy mm, like pleated skirt little plaid skirts little plaid skirts and with the little uh tie crop tops kind of like uh look like britney spears in her first video yeah yeah a lot of a lot of skin showing oh yeah yeah that's the whole point i think Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like hooters in that way and she was also working uh, in, in Myrtle Beach at the House of Blues. Yep, been there too. Yep, pretty cool joint to go to. Yep, good music, yep. good food. And she was also studying cosmetology. She was wanting to be a hairdresser, do makeup, and different things like that. Right. So so she was well on her way to, no, she, well, she was earning, earning her own money and pretty much living on her own. Well, right, and she worked two jobs. So, you know, oh, yeah, she was. That. Yeah, she was a pretty busy girl. She didn't go to school, so, yeah. Yeah, Dale, it was at this point, Heather was working at the Tilted Kilt. And they had a maintenance guy that was coming in, working on the restaurant equipment. Right, keeping up to date. That kind of stuff. Yeah, doing different kinds of work for him. I think he was just a, a kind of like an all-around handyman kind of way, kind of thing, doing different things around the restaurant. But he worked, he worked at several different restaurants. He owned his own company called Palmetto Maintenance. LLC. Yep. And yep. he just done restaurant work. Right. You know. And there's a plenty down there, so it's, it's, it's pretty good uh, business, I guess, to have. Yeah. Because uh, Myrtle Beach is pretty full. Of there's a lot of yeah. restaurants down there, a lot of restaurants. And his name was Sidney Moore. 
and he was 38 years old and he became quite smitten with heather right yeah right off the bat yeah i think so but she is she's a cute girl oh yeah we'll post pictures of her on our of our social media and facebook and instagram and yeah she's a very pretty girl and her being a hostess she's probably first one he saw every time he came in and they probably shooting junk or whatever yep he like said she he became quite spent with her and standing there and talked to him and different things and it was reported well it wasn't reported Dale. it was pretty much assumed that they were having an affair right they were yeah, they, they were seeing each other they probably got in there and it was, the flirty became a little more and a little more so and just keep in mind sydney is 38 and she is 20 so he is almost double her age right yeah and they were having a, a pretty physical relationship he'd come by and bring her bagels and coffee and just to drop by to see her yeah even when he wasn't there to work yeah he would just come in to see her yeah and uh, by her Twitter feed, she wasn't really hiding anything either. Oh, she would post it all out there. And a lot of things some about her. Racy stuff too. Yeah, and we'll put copies of her Twitter account, some of her tweets that she'd put out there on our social media too. Let everybody read some of those. Some of it's pretty rough. How she felt about the maintenance man, and but yeah, let's just give a little bit of background on Sydney Moore Dale. All right. Um, Sydney, like I said, he was a 38 year old and shocker. He was married. He was married. Yeah. And he had three kids. Right. Yeah. And like I said, he repaired kitchen equipment and different things like that. But Heather had tweeted right after they had started seeing each other. that She had a taste for men who were older and she knew he was married. Yeah. So it wasn't like a secret. Yeah. But Heather's roommate, her name was Brianna Warleman, and she was a co-worker of Elvis at that time. Right. And she recalled, she recalled that Heather had pointed him out to her. And almost a month later, she expressed a sexual interest in a tweet that she had said that the guy who builds things at my job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a little more to it. Though. Yeah, but we'll post, like I said, we'll post pictures of these tweets. Heather had become pretty infatuated with Sydney. You know, after him bringing her coffee and bagels to work, she'd even tweeted on July the 7th, 2013, and the tweet says, one of these days, I will drag that man into the mop closet and, ha- and have my way with him. Lord have mercy. Right. Yeah. So she's not missing us here either, so. And the same day, on July 7th, 2013, she tweeted, the guy who builds things at my job makes me cream myself. Hashtag wet dreams tonight. Right. So she wasn't hiding the fact at all that no. she was seeing somebody. Nope. And she was really into him, barely. Yeah, absolutely. But she was more, she was really in love with this dude, I think. Yeah, I think so. And when she, she's fairly young, so she's probably pretty impressionable when he giving her attention and bringing her stuff and all this stuff. So I don't know what her previous relationships, whatever, but after all the stuff with her mom and dad, you know, and getting kicked out of the house and stuff now finally somebody's paying her attention and she's mm-hmm. the, she's the center of their world as far as, as far as she's concerned because i'm sure he was feeding her full of i'm leaving my wife and all this stuff because that's what she had told her roommate you know mm-hmm. but her roommate was like you really ain't believe in all this are you and that's right <laughs> but she was she was falling for him and i don't think uh heather's friend brianna was too fond of this relationship no, no not at all Mm-mm. i think she'd even tried to get heather to to get out of the relationship several times. Well, basically, if you're on the outside looking, you know, in, you, see you it. can see it, right? She's yeah. just blinded by all this. And Dale, there's even one time that, you know, during their relationship, he tried to, well, he actually wanted to get Heather to be their nanny. Yeah. And come work for him, I guess, just to keep her there close to him. Right. So they were, they were planning on moving to Florida. And he brought up that she would be a good nanny for his kids when they moved to Florida. Yeah. I mean, does it not take two people to hire a nanny? Or he just shows like, a little girl show up, said, "Hey, honey, I got us a nanny." Here she is. Yeah, don't mind the skirt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, the affair with Heather and and Sydney pretty much lasted the the whole month of September 2013, and late that month, Heather had tweeted that. Um, well, she tweeted that said, "Once upon a time." An angel and a devil fell in love. It did not end well. Right. And which since has been interpreted referring as a relationship had ended. Yeah, they had just 
cut things off. And Dale, it was shortly after that that Sidney Moore's wife, Tammy, found out about the affair. So she found out after they had already broken up? She did. Okay. And she was not happy at all. Well, I'm sure. Mm -mm. And Brianna, that was Tammy, I mean, uh, Brianna, that was Heather's roommate, said Tammy made Sidney call Heather at the end of the affair with her listening. Yeah. Make her say some, she uh, made him say some pretty vile stuff to her. Yeah, too. pretty much degrading her. Yeah. Said she just used her for sex and it was just, she was just a, just someone who would spread her legs. Right. And whether he meant that or not, it didn't matter. That's what Tammy said that she would say to her and, and he did. Yeah. And it was at this point too. And that just crushed her. Yeah. And it was this point too in Sydney and Tammy's life that, you know, I guess Tammy lost all trust in Sydney. And she would, she took his cell phone, and he could only use it in the, in the presence of her. Yeah, and she changed the passcode, so only she knew it. So he, it didn't matter if, she, if he had it or not, he couldn't use it yeah. unless he opened it up for her. Yeah, exactly. And she would handcuff him to the bed at night yeah. so he couldn't get up and leave. That's a little extreme, I think. Yeah. Whether well, it's true or not, but that's what was reported. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she also made him get a tattoo. Yeah. Now, she, she denied she made him, but... Well, yeah, but it's it's a nice one, isn't it? Yeah, it's right below his belly button, right above his pubic area. Right. Right all the way across. Yep, in big old English letters, it says, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, and we'll post pictures of this, too. We've got pictures. Yeah, so it's like property of here, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, anybody that sees that knows it, yeah, that's Tammy's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, that's pretty. This woman's a little extreme, though, but I'm I'm sure. I know she was pissed off, but that day. Yeah, and it, it was this this point where Tammy started contacting Heather. Yeah, sending her pretty, sending her some nasty text messages and nasty pictures too. Yeah, she would <laughs> text Heather pictures of uh, her and Sydney having sex together. Yeah, and not just regular old stuff. Yeah, it was pretty rough stuff, and. It was even one point Tammy had texted Heather saying, Hey, sweetie, ready to meet the missus? Yeah. So she's still, even though they already broken up, she's still in high confrontation mode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she would threaten Heather, and Heather would text back saying that, No need to worry about me. I'm, I'm nobody. You don't I'm, need to I'm worry nobody about nobody you need to worry about anymore. Mm-mm. Leave me alone. And it was at one point Tammy had texted Heather saying that, By the way, dad no longer has his phone right and she just replied with a period like just hell with it yeah <laughs> me i mean that it, yeah pretty much tammy also tried to get heather fired from her job at the tilted kilt yeah so she kept calling and uh harassing the harassing the boss and everything else about as long as she's there he wouldn't be back to rep- to repair your appliances and this kind of thing but I don't think they they didn't want to get rid of her. She was a good worker. But they even cut her hours or something, didn't they? Yeah, they especially uh, one week because she wouldn't quit calling over and over and over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And then actually said that uh, she had left her phone in the office one time to to recharge, and uh, the the boss was in there doing work, and her phone kept going off, going off, going off, picked it up, and it was her mm-hmm. kept blowing them up. And uh, she could tell by the end that there was some serious stuff going on. Yep. And even a roommate said she had seen some of those pictures she had sent, even one of them with, with him with his head between her legs. And she said, I couldn't get over just that smile on his face. It was just so nasty. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't believe that they would send stuff like that. And it was at one point, Sidney reportedly managed to begin texting Heather again, telling her that his wife had not objected to the fair. And... They tried to play it off like they had an open marriage. Yeah, like and uh, that she wasn't mad about what he did. It was she was mad because he hit it. Yeah, which I don't. Believe I don't buy that at all. I don't no. buy that at all. And they even told that to the police later on. We'll get into, but yeah, I don't buy that at all. No, and pretty much after this is when their family packed up and went to Disneyland for vacation. I think. Yeah, and that would be the Moore family. They went to this was in Myrtle Beach, but they went to Disneyland right. in California. California. Yeah, because they Tammy worked. As a travel agent, I think booking Disney tours. Well, they were uh, Disney people, as if you know, that's a lot of people say. But they were big Disney nuts, and uh, she she did that from uh, working from home, 
and I assume she probably did that. And maybe that somehow or another made their trips cheaper or something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, definitely helping people book Disney vacations and stuff. Yeah, because she stayed home to take care of the kids while he was out doing uh, restaurant work. Mm-hmm. And Dale is on uh, November the fifth of two thousand thirteen when uh, Heather last saw Sydney, and she retweeted a joke by comedian Daniel Tosh. And it kind of almost referenced in the affair. It said, hey, fellas, you can either cheat on your wife or murder her. Never both. That's when you get caught. Right. Which I've seen that before, you know, pop up here and there. It was a joke, whatever. And I'm sure, but when Tammy saw it, I'm sure she took it personal. Yeah. And I'm sure she was following anything this little girl done because she wasn't letting up. And that, No matter what she says. Yep. And that pretty much appeared to be the end of the you know any communication between heather and tammy and sydney yeah for a while yep after heather had ended things with sydney and there was no com- communication anymore heather seemed to be moving on right and trying to get her life back to normal you know she'd gotten a job at a beauty parlor downtown myrtle beach and she was supposed to start there just before christmas right and she was looking forward to that but also there had been some changes in her body that she had noticed. Exactly. Yeah, at this time, said that, uh, even the manager of the Tilted Kilt who ordered the uniform said that she had went up three cup sizes and, and was gaining weight in, mm. the, in the waistline as well. Yeah. And so she was afraid she was pregnant. Yeah. And she figured it was Sydney's. And Heather had taken one pregnancy test. But it uh, came back inconclusive. Yeah. An error or something. I mm, think it came back with an error. Yeah. So, and it, I think there's several different reasons for that. Either the timing was off or it waited too late or too long or not enough pee on the stick. I never take it once, so I don't know. Yeah. So there's another something coming up, you know. Yeah. Now, on the night of December the 17th, Dale, like I said, Heather was trying to get back her life together, doing different things, new things, and she went on a first date with another man. Yep. And his name was Stephen Chiraldi. Right. It was a it was a guy that went to high school with Heather. Yeah, and they were they were friends on Instagram, I think. Yeah, they didn't hang out much stuff, but they were friends on Instagram and kept up with each other, and that's how they started talking. I think he had liked one of her photos or something, and they started communicating back and forth. And he asked her out. He seemed nice, and you know Heather went out with him. Right. Very nice. Yeah. And I'm sure he liked a lot of her photographs on Instagram. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I said Heather was a very pretty girl. Oh yeah. Now on this night of December the seventeenth. Their date started around 10 p.m. And they went out to a Mexican restaurant, I think. Yeah. Yep. And then they went uh, cruising around to, to look at Christmas lights. Yeah. Which is always fun. And later on that night, Dale, they went to the parking lot of the Inlet Square Mall. Yeah, he drove a truck that was a straight drive, which is a manual transmission for folks who don't know what that is. A stick. Yeah, stick. Drive a stick. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and uh, she always wanted to learn to drive. Her roommate had a... Uh, a straight drive car but she wouldn't let her drive because she was afraid she'd burn her clutch out and her dad had tried to teach her several times but you know sometimes dads and daughters yeah, it just wasn't successful yeah, at all right so uh he said well heck i'll teach you so they went in the parking lot and uh he was letting her letting her drive his truck and basically he taught her how to do it and he even took a picture of her driving the, the truck yeah so she sent it to her dad she takes it to her dad right just learn how to drive a stick i'm a pro mm-hmm and we got a, we got pictures of that too, right? Well, they went back and watched the movie, and then uh, after the movie was over, then he took her home. Yeah, I think they shared a, a night kiss or something. Yeah, maybe something simple like that. But then they they had made plans to hang out the next day after he got off work. Yep, yep. It was this was around one fifteen <coughs> when he dropped her off at home. Yep, one fifteen. Now, Dale, get this: twenty minutes later, a call was placed from a, from a payphone to Heather's cell phone, and it lasted almost five minutes yep so this this uh there's a lot of times and stuff coming up here on this timeline that's pretty important and yeah it's kind of easy to get lost but we'll try to explain it as easy as best we can because it's all really important and shortly after this call heather calls her roommate brianna who was out of state visiting her parents for christmas holidays yeah, she went to florida hanging with her parents for christmas mm-hmm. Correct. and heather said that sydney had called telling her that it was he was planning to leave his wife tammy and asking her to meet him yep wanted he wanted to see her yep so she's all ecstatic yeah she was freaking out 
But and the roommate was like, no, 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 you don't do this. Telling her that she'd been doing good. She went on a date. You're over this mess. Yeah. You're, you're doing well. Let it go. Leave him alone. Please don't do this. Yeah. And she said she she was just uh, she was going to sleep on it before making any kind of decision. Yep. But she didn't. No, that didn't happen. Now, Don, it's also important to say that when Sydney called her, she didn't know the number. No. She didn't recognize the number when it came up, and she didn't answer it first, and then it called back. And, she, and then she answered it because it was a local number, but it wasn't one that she knew. And that's because it was a, a call from a payphone. Yeah, and that's what she told Brianna that, you know, why did you even answer the call if it was Sydney? But that's when she said it, it came from just a local so number. It was a local number, so I thought maybe it was somebody that I knew that I just didn't have their number. Needing help or needing something. Right. But she tried to call the number back. Yep. Several times. I think up to nine times, I think she tried to call. Yeah. After she had already hung up and said that she was not going to meet him. but So then I guess she just got to thinking about it and wanted to talk to him some more, so she tried to call him back. Yeah, Dale, we got a lot of different times right here, phone records and different things. And, and it was around 2.29 a.m., Heather's phone attempts to call the pay phone, but there's no answer. Right. And around two, That's where we just said she called several times. Yeah. Okay. And around 2.42 a.m. to 2.56 a.m., Heather's phone is at Longbeard's Restaurant in Carolina Forest. Right. And this is all from uh, cell phone records where her phone is being pinged. It's not in use. It's just that way they knew where she was. And it's kind of a – it's kind of a – comes from later on when they find her car. They went back and searched all these phone records. But we'll give them to you all in order right here now so it all makes sense. Yep. And just a minute later, around 2.57 a.m., it shows uh, Heather's phone heads toward Augusta Plantation Drive and then turns around. And then goes right back to the to the, to the bar at Longbeards. In Carolina Forest. So we're looking at uh, 2.42 to 2.56. And then 2.57, she started leaving and then goes back. Mm-hmm. Right. So then at 3.02... From three, from basically from three o'clock to three fifteen, she stays at Longbeard. Yep. And then at three sixteen, she tries to call Sydney's cell phone. Yeah, for the first time. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the first time she tried to call that after talking to him. I guess she finally got up the nerve to call the cell phone after he had called her on the the payphone. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And at three sixteen to three nineteen, Heather's phone heads back to her apartment. Right. And from 319 to 324, Heather's phone stays at her residence. So I'm, I'm assuming this Longbeard's is really near her. her it's probably her just right there in that, in that plantation. In that little, that little, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now at 317 to 321, Heather again attempts to call Sydney's cell phone, and it's answered this time. And the call lasts four minutes and 15 seconds. And at this time, Heather's phone is still at her house, and Sydney's phone is pinging at his house. Mm-hmm. So... Right now we know where both people are, and they're talking to each other. Yeah, they're talking. And that is 3.17 to 3.21. These people don't ever sleep. Now, Dale, at 3.25, it shows Heather's phone moves from her residence to Peachtree Boat Landing. So four minutes later. Yes. After the phone call. Yeah, Peachtree Boat Landing is on the Waccamaw River. Waccamaw. Wah, wah, come on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And this is it's a little bitty landing. It's like a two lane boat landing with a little parking lot. Yeah, it's small. We'll we'll post a picture of that too. Yeah, because it's small. So so far what we got is he he called her from a payphone, and she talked to him, freaked out, called her roommate, decided she's not going to do nothing. Thought about it, went to the bar, tried to call a cell phone, no answer. Started to leave, went back to the bar. And then she went home. Mm-hmm. And then she tried to call him again, and then he answered. After they talked for four or five minutes, two minutes later, she's in her car heading here. So we are assuming that she's talking to Sydney, because I don't think she would talk to Tammy if it was, she was answering the phone. He sweet-talked her out of that for house. five minutes. Yeah. Right. So they're baiting her in or something to go to meet him at Peachtree Landing. Yeah. So that's where we are. And Dale, Peachtree Landing during the day is a pretty family friendly oriented place you know it's a lot of you know families go there to put their boats in the water right. and have activities but i think after the sun goes down at night it comes a little bit more of a shady shady place well you know ain't many people putting the boat in at night unless you're going fishing i guess yeah and it's not uncommon to see 
cars parked there at night. People yeah. leave rides with somebody somewhere. Yeah, it's probably just a place where you can dump your car off. Don't have to worry about nobody towing it off or anything. Yeah. Okay, so now we we just said that what we're thinking is that uh, he has talked her into meeting him at Peachtree or Landing, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. So at 3.36 a.m., a private video surveillance camera captures a dark-colored F-150 coming from the direction of the Moore home and heading toward the boat landing. And then this camera is like two miles from the from his house yeah and so it's important to say here that i guess that uh that sydney has a ford f-150 yeah he does right a dark that's black actually so then at 338 which is two minutes later heather attempts to call sydney's phone but there's no answer now her phone is being shown that she is at the boat landing and trying to call him but so she tried to call him again at 339 and then again right after that 46 seconds later and still not getting any answer mm-hmm now, Dale, at 3.39 a.m., a business video surveillance is located about a mile from the first camera and closer to Peachtree Landing captures the same vehicle moving in the direction of the boat landing. Correct. So it's still heading toward the... Yeah. Now, at 3.41, which is two minutes later, she tries to call him again. Yeah. Still no answer. And at 3.42 a.m., Dale, Heather's cell phone data activity ends at that point at 3:42 a.m. Right. So it's either been shut off, destroyed, battery died. Yep. One of the three. 3:42 a.m. Right. And just a few minutes later at 3:45, the same video surveillance camera captures the truck moving from the direction of the boat landing and heading back toward the Moore residence, which is Sydney and Tammy's, you know, their house. Yeah. And the camera is approximately one and a half miles from the landing. So basically, if you look at it, the timeline from where it caught the truck headed toward the boat landing is about the same amount of time as from when her phone died as it's heading back. Yeah. So it would be about the same distance if it's fast where it was going. Exactly. Now, Dale, at 3.46 a.m., a private residence video surveillance captures this vehicle headed from the boat landing toward the Tammy and... Uh, Sydney's residence. Right. So basically what we did here, we went through the whole deal where from the time he called her on a pay phone, which was weird, until the time he talked to her again on his cell phone from his house and talked to her and tell her to come meet him, apparently. Well, we're just assuming this is what happened, to where she drove to there, and then we see their truck. Well, apparently it's their truck. We assume it's their truck. There's Mm -hmm. no real data that says it's precisely is but anyway headed that way and then her phone dies and then the, the truck is headed back yep and, and then the next morning they find her car at Peachtree Land and kind of pulled in sideways but nobody's in it yep now we need to note one thing here that it was in the early hours on December the 18th Dale the security cameras at the Myrtle Beach Walmart it was about 1 a.m. to 1 12 that night it showed Sydney going into Walmart, and seven minutes later, he bought cigars and a pregnancy test mm-hmm. and left. Right. And there's also footage from a kangaroo gas station that's located on Joe White Avenue, and it showed Sydney making a phone call from that payphone across the street. So that proves that right there that the the the, the payphone call to her was indeed him. Yeah. And that was, he bought that pregnancy test, not even, I was going to say 20 minutes, but it wasn't even 20 minutes before he called her. Yeah. So, so they went, so he went to Walmart, bought a pregnancy test, then drove to the payphone and called her. But now I've seen, I've seen this video and it, it's grainy. It shows a figure going to the payphone. Right. That phone outside that kangaroo store doesn't get used. Well, I'm sure. At that time, it didn't use, it didn't use a lot. Well, I'm sure there's not many pay phones that do get used. No, but that was the the same phone that called her cell phone. Correct. To get her out of the house. Now, when they found her car, you know, it said it was parked sideways, but it was like went across two, almost three parking spots. But to me, it's like, you know, if you see somebody you know, are you going to just pull up and talk to somebody? You just kind of whoop it in the parking lot and is not it really matter? You just pull you up. You just pull in. Nobody else is there. So Especially just, in the middle of the night. Right. You just whoop in because you just want to talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, this was December the 19th. This was just the next day. And Heather's car was found. And according to the local news and media, the car was locked. Yep. 
and Heather's keys, cell phone, and purse were not inside. Correct. Yeah, I said that uh, a deputy had found it, and then uh, they, they run a tag and seen that her dad had owned it, and they drove over to the family's house and asked them if they were missing the car. And her mom said, well, look down the driveway. It's like, no, we're not missing the car. But she wasn't even thinking that Heather's car was still in their name. Yeah, this was a Dodge Intrepid that yeah. she was driving. Yeah. And uh, she said that uh, that's when he asked her about the Dodge Intrepid, and that's when it hit him. And he asked uh, her dad if he had extra keys. He said, yes. Yeah. So he rode with the, the police officer back over to the scene. Mm-hmm. And when they got there, he was going to open up for him and said the police officer opened up his trunk and gave put himself a, a pair of gloves on and gave her dad a pair of gloves and said, just in case. Let's open it, but we're going to put the gloves on. Yeah. And then when they opened it, they opened up the car. It, it didn't really look like a, a struggle or anything had happened. So it was kind of weird that her driver's license and the several business cards were laying on the console. But like you said, her purse and her cell phone and the keys were all gone. They said the car was kind of a mess, but that's just kind of the way she kept it. You know, she was always busy running here and two jobs and school and everything else. So I'm sure it was fast food bags and et cetera in there but it didn't look like a struggle there's no blood or no nothing like yeah, that yeah she didn't so, keep her car clean at right, all right so it was it wasn't like it was really out of the ordinary how it looked yep and then it said that uh the police officer wanted to open up the trunk and her dad said he was just scared to death to open up that trunk he didn't know what he's gonna say oh, i can't imagine but they popped the trunk and there was nothing there either Mm-mm. so then i think the police officer allowed him to take the car home yeah because he didn't feel there was no nothing it didn't look like it was a, a crime scene or anything to him all right it's at this point where uh they were trying to figure out what's going on where she is or you know and so her dad and the police are trying to figure out and then talk to uh to heather's roommate and also talk to management at the tilt to kill who had informed her that they hadn't heard anything from her but they did know that she was having an affair with uh with sydney but she did say that she thought it was a that the affair was over. But Sydney still may know her whereabouts or know what's going on with her. Yeah, so it hadn't been that long since. And they did also talk to her, this Stephen Chiraldi. Yes, they did because they knew about the date, and they went and took him in and talked to him, and they, he was clear right quick, off the very quickly. Yeah, he was you know, more than, more than glad to help, and then, mm-hmm. so that's when they decided they need to go talk to Sydney. Yep, and they go to his house, and he meets them at the bottom of the driveway. Yeah. You know, they talk about some stuff, and basically, he denies everything. It's over. I ain't talked to her in six weeks. I don't know nothing about what you're talking about, and I ain't seen her, and you guys need to leave. Exactly. He kind of just blew them off that quick. Mm -hmm. But then, that's when uh, her dad decided to do all that uh, stuff about the cell phone records, which we just gave you. Mm -hmm. So then they start piecing together about the truck. And they see the truck and all this stuff. So then they're thinking, wait a minute, this guy's, there's more going on than what this guy said. So they ask uh, Tammy and Sydney to come in and to, for some more questioning. And then when they go in, that's when they ask him if he had made this phone call. He uh, asked him if he had made this, this phone call from the payphone. At the and, kangaroo store. From the kangaroo store. And he just laughed. He goes, you mean they still have uh, payphones? Uh. And he goes, uh, well, yeah. And said, uh, actually said uh we have some video surveillance film so uh somebody make uh, of you making that phone call yeah so so let's, let's ask that question again are, are you sure <laughs> you're not the one who called her he goes well maybe and he kind of laugh about it a little bit and then he goes well okay yeah i was the one that called her but i was just calling her to tell her not to call me no more yeah because he said that she'd been leaving notes on his car trying to get back together with him trying to reestablish some kind of connection with him and he was afraid his wife was going to see it yeah and he was trying to build his it, according to sydney he was trying to get his his marriage back together telling the cops he, he was handcuffed to the bed every night for had, six months agreement or something yeah like that. yeah it had his cell phone taken away and uh, he was trying to fix his marriage right but so right off the bat he's lying exactly <laughs> he's done he's done changed the story on the phone call yeah so right off the bat he's lying to him so they know something's up it's, it's, it's fishy yep you know, it was after the day after you know Heather's car was found. A search was the area was done around the boat landing, and no sign of Heather was found at all. No, they had even had divers go in and, and uh, probably also seeing across the waterway. But even had divers come in from uh, Coastal Carolina University and other places, and, but they didn't find anything. Now they did find a set of bones uh, in another. It was area, close by there, yeah. yeah. But it, it uh, they turned out to be male, so it was nothing to, to do with this. Mm-hmm this point dale there had been nothing on heather at all no activity they hadn't been able to find anything 
And it was twice during February of the next year, Sidney Moore told police that people had fired at him or brandished weapons. Yeah, and were shooting at him. Yeah, shooting at him and his family. Because and, they were made out to be such bad people Yeah, in the story and stuff. And it was even in a former uh, incident that uh, Georgetown County Deputy Sheriff, uh, they saw no signs of his truck had been fired at or anything like that. Or no, nobody had heard gunshots or shells had hit or anything like that. Yeah, lying again, I think. Yeah. All right, you know, they went and uh, they took a search warrant and uh, – went to search the moore's residence yeah and they were there uh 11 hours i think mm -hmm. searching stuff now they never did release exactly what they found but i know they did find like a bag of cement they found a thing of uh cleaning fluids and they found uh a spent shotgun shell yeah but they didn't release anything else to do but it, after the 11 hour search of uh, the property and everything that they did arrest them for kidnapping okay so i'm assuming they found something they had to have because they arrested them for that in uh, two counts of indecent exposure, which I'll assume that's from those nice photos that they were sending her and some other stuff. Said they found some more stuff like that on her phone that was taken in public places. Mm -hmm. But I think that's just the extra charge just so they can hold them longer or something to put something together. Yeah, to try to get something on them. Right. Like I said, the, they had arrested the Moors, and the Moors posted a $20,000 bond that was you know set for two charges – but later waived the bond on kidnapping charges in favor of the murder charges, on which they were initially held without bond. And a month after the arrest, the court imposed a gag order on all participants in the case. Yep. Even Sidney and Tammy couldn't talk to anybody about it. But Sidney did. Yeah, he did. He talked to a news reporter. Right. That's when he was whining about they had been wrongly accused and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he got in trouble for that. Yeah. Actually, he got he had to spend some time for that. I think he did. But now they was they were they had uh, ankle monitors on them, and Sydney had gotten a job offer in Florida. Right. Yeah, though, I think when they let them out, that was part of the the deal when they got out, and then they couldn't go. Uh, I think it was five miles from the from the Elvis home and some other stuff. Yeah, they couldn't go anywhere Sydney. near the Elvis right family. There'd been so much in between them, you know, as far as bad blood, I guess you'd say. Yeah, but Sydney had a job offer in Florida. Right. And they had a deal where the Moors could move to Florida and for him to take this job, but they still had to wear the ankle monitors. Yeah. And they would work in Florida. And they were required to uh, meet their bail conditions and waive extradition and stuff. So that if anything happened, they they would have to come back. Yeah, so they, they went to Florida, but Tammy was taking care of the kids, homeschooling the kids, so she wasn't able to go anywhere. And Sydney just working back. Hmm. And that was That was all they could do. Yeah, because I'm sure, I'm sure after all this happened, there was there were, nobody wanted them in the community. No. All right, Dale. On March 2016, the prosecutors dropped the murder charges against both Sydney and Tammy without prejudice, meaning that they could reinstate this later, should the state decide to. Right. I figure they didn't have quite enough that they thought they could get a conviction. So without. I guess uh, worried about double jeopardy coming into play. Yeah, a smart thing to do. But they had them on kidnapping, so they'd go with a kidnapping ankle. Right? Yeah, they, yeah, at least they would have them yeah. for something. Yeah, they thought pretty sure they could prove that. Yep. But you know the the Elvis family, they were very very disappointed. Right. And they but they understood that the prosecutors had to make decisions like that and hoped that further investigation of the trial and outstanding charges would eventually lead to to you know exactly what happened to their daughter you know heather yeah i think they were more were i think they were like most people really would rather know what happened than or where she is than worrying about what they're charging them with exactly now in june 2016 that's when they finally went to charge uh went to charge that's when they went to trial for uh for sydney on the kidnapping charges mm -hmm. and they tried heather um, and they tried sydney and tammy separately separately yes yeah yes and uh I guess that, that way they could try to force them to turn on each other or whatever mm -hmm. best way to do it. And over the next four days, the state presented its case on uh, against uh, Sydney. And then uh, that's when uh, the Heather's co-workers had said that they thought that she had gotten pregnant. So maybe mm -hmm. this would give them more of a motive to get rid of her, you know. And uh, so law enforcement come in and give all those details of the, the phone records we gave before and the video records and everything. And they thought they had a pretty strong case against them. 
and then they even took the jurors out to the Petrie Landon and the Moore's house. But on the last day of the trial, to come in, and then when the jury came back, it wasn't good. No. You come back, so what was it, 7-2? Seven, seven, yeah, 7-2, seven, two, and it was a mistrial. Yep. So they declared a mistrial. Yep. And then after that, that was like only, what, seven hours, I think? Mm-hmm. They decided to, the their lawyer put in that they wanted the next trial to be somewhere else because they didn't think they could get a fair shake. In yeah, the, they needed a change of venue. Yeah. The trial's second day, Sidney spoke to the media about the case, and the judge found him in contempt of court for violating this gag order and sentenced him to five months in jail. Right. He was released after two to good behavior for good behavior and upon release he spoke to the media again saying that he felt the jury in the trial had not been impartial and that the whole case amounted to malicious prosecution but Dale, heather's roommate brianna the last day of trial was taken up mostly by her her testimony and she described the affair between her roommate and sydney in greater detail and became upset you know saying that the conversation you know, with Heather. Yeah, a lot of that's hard to listen to. So. Yeah. The defense asked about sometimes Heather had had difficulties with her family and former boyfriends of hers and from prior relationships with Sydney and and who, Brianna reported it to be abusive. Yeah. She even came to work once with a black eye, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's made up a silly excuse like she hit herself with the car door, I believe. Yeah. But nobody was believing it, so... And after the judge re- rejected the defense motion for a, um, a directed verdict and not guilty, Sidney's attorney, Kurt Truslow, rested his case, making his close, closing argument to the jury, and the case against his client was entirely circumstantial and only proved that Sidney and Heather had an affair. Right. But, you know, like we said, the, the jury come back with a um, – they were a hung jury. In 2017 is when the, the uh, July of 2017, the second trial commences. And the case, again, focused on all the cell phone records and the video stuff and uh, everything that they had going on. Now, a cousin of Tammy's also testified, which was pretty shocking, that, that at some point after the disappearance, Sidney had shown him something on his phone, which indicated that he had known more about this than he was telling. But they, they never did elaborate on in court to what he had actually shown him on the phone. Yeah. So something's going on. It was almost like a a, a photo of Heather. Or something, yeah. Yeah. But it, it didn't elaborate, so we don't know exactly what it yeah. was. And then after three days, this time Sydney was convicted. Search continues this morning for Heather Elvis. She disappeared in 2013 and is presumed dead, but her body's never been found. Sidney Moore will spend 30 years in prison now for kidnapping and conspiracy in the case. The jury handed down that guilty verdict on Wednesday after less than two hours of deliberation. Heather Elvis's family and Moore made emotional pleas as Moore maintains he's innocent. If I, if I could give a closure, I would. I mean, anything I tell them would be a lie. There's nothing I can tell them to give them any closure. This is over but we still haven't found Heather. And it's like I was telling the judge, there has to be something more. There has to be something more that we could hold over their head to make them talk. Moore is already serving 10 years on an obstruction of justice charge in the case. Hours after Moore was found guilty, family and friends of Heather Elvis gathered for a vigil in Socasty. They fixed up the memorial and lit candles at the Peachtree Landing, which is where Elvis's car was found abandoned nearly six years ago in october the next year is when tammy finally goes on trial right yep so they're dragging this out a lot yeah it's being dragged out a lot but there was a couple other things that came out it said that actually that sydney had taken his sim card out of his cell phone when he had made that uh, that pay phone call yeah so they wouldn't be able to track where he was mm-hmm. and if you look at the timeline when we go back after she had talked to Sydney about uh, meeting, or we assume talked to him about meeting him at Peachtree, you know, she tried to call several times, and nobody was answering the phone. Meanwhile, we see on surveillance that the truck was headed toward, you know, to meet her, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm saying that uh, what they did is they, after, after they made the phone calls and he was home and told her to meet her there, they both intentionally left their phones at home. So they would ping at home so they would have an alibi that they were nowhere near there, that their, home, their phones were home. 
Yeah. That's why she couldn't get a hold of him when she tried to call him those last three or four times. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. So that's what I think. They were trying to be smart, but they weren't too smart. Right. Well, and then they would do stuff even like when she's getting ready to go on trial, you know, she just post stuff on Facebook like like uh, Heather was a psycho whore and, and all this stuff. So she wasn't making it easier on herself. Mm -mm. And she tried to make herself out to a victim, but she definitely was not. She was pretty vindictive and said a lot of nasty stuff. Showing her, you know, her character is not not, not too good. <laughs> so basically what they did, they – Sydney lured her out of that house thinking he was wanting to get back, at, back with her. Yeah. And then they – him and Tammy. Right. And it's important to know that too because – that that comes in with kidnapping. Yeah, you know, it's not necessarily just the act of doing it. If you bait someone into coming to somewhere under false pretenses, and then something happens, that's also kidnapping. So this is a big reason why they could, they were able to be charged with kidnapping. Mm -hmm. They put that together, like I just said, you know, and they knew everything had happened. They followed the, the timelines, the video surveillance, the, so they knew that she was being set up. So that that also is kidnapping. Yeah, that not just baiting her, putting her in a trunk. You know, baiting her is, is also part of kidnapping. Right. So that explains why it's the, you know it can be convicted of it. That makes a whole lot of sense. So you know, it's just not just throwing you in the trunk, but if I bait you into coming into a an unknown uh, situation, mm -hmm. and then something happens to you, that's still kidnapping. Yep. Under South Carolina, anyway. So then, uh, eventually, Tammy was convicted too, right? Yep. Yeah, was this, this was in October of, two, of 2018. It was almost five years after Heather's disappearance. Tammy Moore went on trial for the charges. And this drawed a lot of national attention, Dale. It was almost like, for South Carolina and Myrtle Beach, it was like the, the crime of the century. Yeah. And they showed that Tammy had been driven into a jealous rage when she learned that Heather might be pregnant. Right. And which was giving her motive to harm Heather. But first, we have team coverage on the guilty verdict reached in the Tammy Moore trial. Patrick Lloyd and Marissa Tancino both live from the courthouse tonight. First, let's send it to Marissa, who's been following this trial for more than two weeks since it began. Marissa, for a long trial, didn't take the jury long at all to reach that guilty verdict. Yeah, that's right, Eric and Meredith. It was only about four hours before the jury reached a verdict. This comes after two full weeks of witness testimony, evidence ranging from phone records to surveillance video, and over 30 witnesses called by the state to the stand that the jury was able to make a decision. We, the jury, find the defendant, Tammy Kaysen Moore, guilty of kidnapping. Quiet sobs come from Heather Elvis's family and friends in the courtroom when the verdict came down, but Moore maintained her innocence before the judge when able to speak. I feel like I'm begging for my life for something that I didn't do that I didn't have anything to do with. The Elvis family also spoke to the judge before Moore was sentenced, asking the judge to impose the maximum. Because she stole my sister from me. <laughs> And five years ago, this world swallowed our family whole. Moore was ultimately sentenced to 30 years in prison for each charge. Two sentences she'll serve at the same time. She hugged her family before exiting the courtroom. Moore's defense attorney, Greg McCollum, spoke with us after the verdict was announced. Well, the jury was put in a very tough position. Uh, if, if, and, and they didn't ask to be jurors, and I understand that. We appreciate them serving, uh, but we're very disappointed with the outcome. But McCollum says this isn't the end for the defense. The jury verdict, it is what it is, and we're in the process of uh, we'll be filing an appeal, and we don't think that this is the end of the matter. Regardless of the sentencing, the Elvis family says this is something a verdict can't fix. I know that she has children. I, I feel them greatly, but she didn't think about her children when she made this decision. But now her family's remembering Heather hoping this will bring some sort of peace to her. And I ask that you give me that because she deserves it, because she can't stand here by herself. Wherever she may be. Now, Tammy Moore was taken straight out of the courtroom after sentencing this afternoon. Her attorney, Greg McCollum, tells us that right now they're trying to get the gag order lifted that they've been under for four years and hopefully will be able to make a statement then. So you think when they went and to Walmart and got that, that pregnancy test that was the see if she was pregnant yeah I think so get her to make it take a test 
But, but see, when uh, Sydney was asked about that pregnancy test, is, he was saying that him and Tammy were trying to get pregnant. They right. were wanting another kid. Well, they also said they was riding around for three hours having sex in different places in the truck. Yeah. <laughs> to that night. But yeah. Anytime they were asked to explain a gap of time that was missing, that's what it was. But they couldn't remember what parking lot it was, but they were in a parking lot having sex in the truck. Mm-hmm. So he's not really good at no. <laughs> making up stuff. They were, like I said, they were trying to be smart, but they weren't. Right. And even they said that, you know, the handcuff thing, that and that was not true. It was just for sexual role play. And then they even had a, a tattooist come in and say that that tattoo was done in 2012. That was long before they had ever met. And so they had a little backup story for stuff, but most of it was not believable. Uh, I don't think it's very credible. Mm-hmm. So both of them were convicted. And both of them got, I guess in the long run, they were both had to serve con, uh, concurrent ser- uh, sentences. The two of them was like 30 years, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tammy was sentenced to 30 years for each to run concurrently with credit for time served. And shortly afterwards, she would be appealing the verdict since it was based entirely on circumstantial evidence with different lawyers rep- representing her. And she felt her trial's lawyers had done, you know, they, they, they did a bad job. Right. But hell, I mean, look what they got to what to work work with, you know. And even the the day after the trial ended, uh, Heather's father Terry Elvis appeared in court to face contempt charge. And one of Tammy's lawyers, Casey Moore, alleged that on the first day of the trial, Terry had yelled obscenities and insults at him as they met in the bathroom. Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah, violating the court's injunction, don't have any, have any verbal contact with Moore's lawyers or attorneys or anything like that. Right. And through his own lawyer, uh, Heather's dad, Terry, admitted the contact but denied being verbally abusive. And he insisted his defense that Sidney had used the bathroom on the side of the courthouse that was supposed to be used by the Elvises. Yeah. And the court fined him, found him guilty and fined him $400. Well, I'm going to tell you, if, if I thought somebody took my little girl, the verbal contact would, would be the least you had to worry about. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his head's gonna get slammed in the toilet in that bathroom yeah yeah well, i guess as a lawyer so i'd be a little bit <laughs> exactly yeah dale this case was just in the news here recently as of uh, september the 21st 2020 and there was a deadline imposed upon sydney moore to come forward with substantial evidence in the, the disappearance of heather elvis in exchange for less jail time but Sydney didn't say anything. Hmm. So you think he don't know? Or he just don't want to admit to it? He might just don't want to admit to it. I wonder how much how much time he's going to cut. They, they didn't say. say. Yeah. I believe he's guilty as hell. I believe they killed her. Yep. I don't know what you think. But when you put all this together, they basically baited this little girl into coming out, went and got her, took her back to the house, even though then when they found... Now, they explained away, you know, that she, she said they needed the bag of cement that they found for his work, which I don't know how you use that to fix a stove or whatever in a restaurant, but that's what she said. Mm-hmm. And then she explained that the cleaning fluids was to clean up their nasty camper, and the shotgun shell could have been from a previous turkey hunt. Now, one other thing they had against the Moors on this case, Dale, it was two days after Heather disappeared. Video surveillance shows Tammy and Sydney cleaning out his new f-150 pickup truck right and i mean they weren't just cleaning it they were scrubbing this truck especially the passenger side right and pressure weird. washing the inside of this truck and they didn't find anything it was like when they when they did finally get a chance to uh, search the truck it was overly clean yeah. Said, yeah and the towels they used to clean this truck they burned them i wonder why yeah, I wonder. That's what I usually do, you know. Everybody burns their towels after they wash their truck. I get out my pledge, clean up the table, and burn my rags. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, yeah, they, yeah. So, it probably had some Heather DNA on it. I'm sure it did. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I don't know. I think that's what they did, and they, they lured her back and put her in the car and they took her out. Yep. Which is really sad. Yep. I hate this for Heather, but hopefully something one day will be found about Heather and they will find exactly what happened to her yeah you got anything else to add to this deal no i think that's about it i mean they they tried to cover their tracks they thought they were being smooth they thought they were being slick waited till she got done with that date 
And then that's when they pounced. And little did they know she was going to call her friend in Florida and let her know what's going on. And then did they know how smart that they were going to be about following the phone pings and the and the phone cell the the cell phone trail and the surveillance and cameras and those cameras watching them drive there and drive back. All of that combined together was their downfall. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And they thought they were being smooth. Yeah. But they got them. You know, and it's sad because the little girl tried to get out of it. She was done with it. And and just seemed like as soon as she'd get out, then uh, Tammy would pull her back in because she just couldn't get over it. Mm-mm. So that's why I don't buy the open marriage gimmick, you know, because she said that the whole time she had boyfriends and stuff. So she didn't. it didn't really matter who she did or what or what or who he did or what he was doing or doing it with, but she was just mad because he didn't tell her, but I don't buy that at all. Exactly. Yeah, I don't buy it. Because she's so damn jealous. There ain't no way that's happening. Yeah, Tammy was very vindictive. Yeah, you you can kind of see it in her photos. Yep. (laughs) All right, Dale, that is the disappearance of Heather Elvis. It is. Sad, sad times. All right, we're going to get out of here. We want everybody to... Um, weigh in tell us what you think happened to heather tell us what you think about sydney and tammy moore and what you may have think have happened to heather yeah what do you do what what do, what does your puzzle look like when you put together all these pieces is it like ours or is it a little different that's it we're always interested in what you think all right we want everyone to be safe be careful and always be aware of your surroundings because the next episode could be about you this is the crack, crack house, house chronicles, chronicles.